you so much for taking time out of your busy day to listen to me share my story. I'm so thrilled to be vulnerable with you and to hopefully provide you with advice and support. Let me start off by saying that I'm an extremely anxious person, which you will definitely soon hear all about. So this is really scary for me, but I know how important it is to share my story. So this is what I must do. Whether you are a parent of or a teen or young adult with ADHD or anxiety, I want to help validate your experience and feelings by being open with you about mine. My name is Mallory Band, and I have been working in the education and special education field for over seven years now. Currently, I work as an executive function coach at Essig Education Group, where I work primarily with one-on-one -on -one -on -one with middle and high school students, helping them gain independence and confidence while improving their organizational, planning, and study skills. Starting this role has helped me view myself through a different lens. My students have begun to help me cope with my ADHD and anxiety in ways that I did not think were possible. Speaking with parents about working memory overload, attention, and anxiety through my firsthand experiences helped me realize that I am normal. I just have to do things differently to find success. Success takes shape in numerous ways. We must figure out how to create and find our own forms of success. It's okay that my path to success looks differently than that of my peers, but I would be lying if I said that this path was linear. I still struggle daily with my anxiety. I have just learned how to better cope with and manage it. Growing up, I was always a straight A student who worked diligently and with great resilience. Although I did have and still do have low self-confidence in my abilities. It's funny how drastically different you can view yourself compared to how others see you. Most of my friends and colleagues would see me as a confident, creative, intelligent, flexible, and hardworking young woman. But much, much of the time, I feel like an imposter, like I don't belong, or that someone will call me out for being a fake, even though I'm really good at what I do, and I do have the appropriate credentials. Despite growing up with two extremely loving parents, who were very well versed in the special education world, I still deeply struggled with feeling like I was capable of meeting the standards I envisioned people set for me. What I wish for all children growing up with ADHD, anxiety, or any learning difference is that you understand you are not alone. Loneliness and shame are emotions that perpetuate alienation. Having transparent conversations with our children, like we're doing here today, about how their brains are wired is a key component to ensuring that students can begin to see their value and their positive attributes. I would like to share two stories with you to begin this conversation and to give you clear insight into my childhood experiences with ADHD and anxiety. My earliest school-related memory is from kindergarten. My teacher would assign a small homework packet on Monday that was due on the Friday of each week. Little did I know that my approach to completing my work was a unique one compared to the rest of my five-year-old peers. And this is something that took me years to understand and that I'm still continuing to understand currently. During one particular week, our homework was to create an alphabet book. Each page had a different letter, and we were supposed to cut out or illustrate different images that started with that letter. A reasonable approach to this assignment would be to do six or seven letters a night for the next four nights, and then I'd be set to turn everything in on Friday, right on time. But for me, this was simply not an option. This feeling of panic that in the next several years became all too familiar, well, it set in and propelled me forward at 100 miles per hour. My rational thinking quickly went off the rails, and my irrational, anxious brain was in the driver's seat 
and never, ever bothered to look back. My parents tried to explain to me that there was no need to do all 26 letters in one night. I heard the words they were saying, but my brain would just not let me process or accept this as an option. I could just not let the unfinished work lay there on the table. It felt so uncomfortable. An hour-long tantrum of screaming and crying ensued on the corner of the stairs leading up to my bedroom. This would be a weekly occurrence. Ultimately, I stayed up way too late for a five-year-old, but I did finish my A to Z book, and I turned it into my teacher on Tuesday, feeling a great sense of pride. The second story also takes place on those same stairs. So I guess that's sort of where a lot of my meltdowns would occur. So I recall sitting on those stairs and my mom said something to the extent of, you're going to be going to a new school next year as your school ends in sixth grade. So for seventh grade, you're gonna go to a new school. So what we're gonna do is go visit a school and you're just gonna miss the following morning of school and then you'll return in the afternoon, no big deal. So for most kids, this would be great. You get to miss school. But for me, oh no, this felt awful. This seemed like the end of the world. I was, and I still am, an extremely rigid person who thrives in having a routine. So when my routine is altered, I feel a deep sense of panic and discomfort. So similar to the first story, I spent the next two hours laying and screaming and crying on those stairs because I was so worried that I was gonna miss something important at school the next day. And there was no way I would ever be able to make up that missed work. Of course, ultimately, looking back on this experience, this visceral reaction seems absurd and ridiculous, but it's also because I'm looking back now with a greater understanding of how my sensitive, reactive ADHD and anxiety impact how I view the world. This experience is parallel to how numerous of my students feel. Part of the reason I am so passionate about working with my students is because I see pieces of myself in each and every one of them. I hope that I'm providing them with the mentorship and guidance that I wish I had at their age, coming from a young adult, dealing and coping with similar experiences and feelings. My goal is to help my students think metacognitively about themselves and their learning while also helping to normalize and destigmatize any negative connotations that accompany these diagnoses. If students can understand why they function and behave as they do, they can begin to accept themselves for who they are and take advantage of strategies to make life easier than it currently is. Yes, we may have to work harder and differently than our peers, and this does seem unfair, but these diagnoses truly do make us unique. Much of my childhood was fueled by anxiety, panic, and intense urgency, which in turn led to extreme meltdowns of crying and screaming and feeling frozen, as I've talked about earlier. So if you ask my husband, well, he'd probably tell you that I'm kind of just an oversized child who may or may not still be having these meltdowns, but I would like to say that I do now have a greater understanding and self-awareness, so these meltdowns occur less frequently and with much less intensity. Also, so yes, I am still having these meltdowns, but it is not to say that I have not made, I have made tons of progress since I was five years old. So these meltdowns do not look the same. So I will take that as a win to some extent. As my therapist says, we can't fix or eliminate our anxieties, but we can make a game plan to help ourselves quiet the extraneous noise around us. My mom and my husband are my sounding boards. Throughout these past few years, I have learned how important and valuable it is to build up a team of support around you. You are so much stronger when you realize that you are not alone and that you certainly do not have to embark on this journey blindfolded and by yourself. 
everyone needs help from time to time, no matter how old or how smart you are. Asking for help is not a weakness, but in fact, an invaluable strength to possess and practice every single day. Although it can be scary, it is so integral to verbalize your vulnerabilities. Because if we do not do this, we cannot learn to advocate for ourselves. For me, I struggle deeply when my routines change, when receiving feedback that I often feel as a personal attack, and worrying about getting things done as soon as possible. But throughout these hardships, meltdowns, and sessions with my students, I have truly begun practicing a proactive approach when experiencing extreme emotions. For me, I am so self-aware that I can verbalize why I am feeling the way I am, but I struggle with taking action and flipping my mindset. Thus, when I'm feeling anxious, I typically start off by calling my mom or just talking with my husband to get all of these feelings out from deep inside of me. After venting or collecting my thoughts, I create a plan of action. I'm the kind of person who needs to write things down and visually have my plan set in place. I try to think of my past successes and how I can use these experiences to calm my central nervous system and slow down my irrational thoughts and anxious brain. No matter what you may be feeling, there is always a way to cope with these emotions. The better you get to know yourself, the more tools you'll have in your self-care arsenal. Now, I'd be lying if I told you that this was easy or that I'm a master at this, because I am certainly not. I'm a work in progress, and I'm okay with that. I have come to accept that my ADHD and anxiety are just another part of who I am, but they are not all that I am. I do not let them, let them set my limitations for me. I am not sure who I would be or where I would be if I didn't have ADHD or anxiety. But what I do know is that I've learned how to become the hardest worker in the room and how to advocate for myself. It is my hope that I can help unleash these passions for my students and for all of you as well. ADHD and anxiety are my invisible superpowers that directly launch me into my students' worlds. I can truly say I do understand what you're going through or feeling because I experience this on a daily basis, just like you. I share my story with you in the hope that you can begin to understand how valued you truly are. Growing up, I never knew that there were other children out there who struggled the ways I did. Nor did I know that people felt like they were living in a different universe than their peers. I wish a young adult told me that I was not alone. My goal is to use my story to illustrate that diagnoses are labels, but they don't have to be more than that if you don't let them take that power away from you. Despite the way my brain is wired and the heightened feelings of anxiety I experience on a daily basis, I have learned how to become successful and independent. These diagnoses do not define who we are nor how successful we will become. What I wish for all young children is what I wished for my younger self. For someone to sit down with me and look me directly in the eyes and tell me everything is going to be okay. And this is what I'm trying to do for you here today. Life is going to present you with a lot of challenges and you will need to learn how to navigate through them. You will be successful in whatever you choose to pursue in life not despite your diagnosis, but because of it. You are going to change the world one day. You matter. Your voice matters. Understanding your brain and temperament certainly matter. 
I hope that this conversation helped you comprehend how ADHD affects your life by having this open dialogue. It is so important to ask for help and to build up a team of support around you. You can go a lot further with others than trying to navigate this complex world alone. Sure, you will feel lost, frustrated, and depleted at times. But whatever you do, do not give up. Sometimes we just need to pivot and eventually we will find our way. I promise you that. For all the parents that are listening to this today, we can help our children learn to become resilient by providing them with the appropriate tools and information in which they need to become successful. Be present for your child and deeply listen to what they are saying with their words and through their actions. Speak openly to your child about your own vulnerabilities and fears. Sometimes kids don't realize that even adults struggle and feel lost and defeated at times. Empathize with your child. And above all else, just be available to listen to them. Sometimes this is all that they need and that they want. I share my story with you all today because I was you. I still am you. You are not alone. You are not weird. In fact, you are more than enough. My story is never going to be completely finished, but I have this opportunity to use it to help empower children and teens and young adults to begin to understand their value and importance. We need more people like you in this world. Never ever let anyone silence you because your story needs to be heard. Thank you very much for listening to my story about overcoming shame and my experience with ADHD and anxiety. Thank you. Hi, Mallory. That was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> that was wonderful. All right, everybody, we are ready for your questions, and we already have some questions from Emily. Um, thank you, Emily, for all the great questions. So I'm going to um, ask you the first one. Are you ready? Sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, the first question from Emily is, what sort of help um, do you ask for um, from your husband uh, to help with ADHD and anxiety signs? Definitely. So I think that um, we're lucky in a sense, and I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, but we're both pretty open. Uh, he does not have ADHD, but we both have uh, anxiety. So that's no surprise to people who know us. So I think that we are really good at helping each other because we are genuinely a team that wants the other person to succeed. But it can be challenging because we often feel as though we're better at helping the other person and it's harder to help ourselves. It's harder to look in. But I think the fact that we both do deeply understand that even though you might not be able to see these symptoms or these traits, you know, outside of your body physically, um, we acknowledge that it's real and we can really empathize with each other. So I think that we're lucky. I'm lucky in a sense that we both have anxiety and sort of understand what that looks like and feels like but i would just say that the more you can be open with yourself and with the people around you um about what's going on it really can help you understand that you're not alone no matter if someone has anxiety or adhd or add or not we all go through things that are stressful and challenging and feel lost so i think that by just asking for help or can you listen to me? Sometimes I don't want him to say anything or give me advice, but just listen to me talk and I can sort of figure out the problem on my own by just hearing myself talk things out or can you go with me on a walk to take the dog out? I just need to move. I need to get up from this work that's making me feel kind of anxious. So I think understanding what are some things that you can do that are helpful and then just trying to ask others to help help step in and sort of be that that guide when you need it because it can be really hard to help yourself uh, what strategies do you use to mitigate your emotions enough 
to write down an action plan. Definitely. So I think for me, it's just really helpful to be validated by talking to someone first, whether it's my husband, my mom, my, my siblings, my dad, you know, whoever it may be, or um, just kind of getting things out there and then trying to figure out in a, in a sort of a backwards plan, I might be feeling this intense emotion right now. And for me, it's really hard to take a break. I'm someone who everything feels urgent. Everything needs to be done immediately. So for me, I know that sometimes I honestly can't do my best work by trying to go, go, go. So sometimes for me, taking a break, stepping away, letting it, letting things sink in for a moment, and then coming back and realizing, A, that extreme emotion is sort of subdued a little bit now, or B, I still feel whatever I'm feeling, but now... Let me think sort of backwards. This is what I want to achieve. What are the steps that I need to do in order to achieve it? So like a lot of the times when we're working with students, we sort of try to chunk work. Writing a paper can be really stressful. We don't know how to break things down into pieces. So that can be the same way. If we're feeling an extreme emotion, we know that emotions and cognition are extremely intertwined. So if we're not in a place where we can think clearly, Take a break, go move your body, go for a walk, go work out, go talk to someone and then come back and do a brain dump. My boss will tell you sometimes I just, I'm kind of the queen of just writing things down, whether they make sense or not. And then I can sort of piece things together and figure out the details. But sometimes it can just be easier to see things in place and it's like a big crazy puzzle. And then, okay, this goes here. This is actually more logical over here. So just sort of trying to think backwards, but also just being mindful again and being self-aware of, can I do this right now? If I can't, if I can't do my best or think clearly, I can come back in 30 minutes and do it later and that will still be there. Those emotions will probably still be there. Um, so kind of just breaking things down. And the more you practice this, just like it's a sport or a muscle, whatever it is, right? Like we can train these executive functions. So with deliberate practice, it does become easier. It's not easy, but it becomes less stressful, less scary, less confusing. Great, thank you so much. The next question is, what did developing independence look like as an early teen, during your late teens, early 20s, and so on? Yeah, that's a great question. And honestly, I think uh, I'm still trying to do that. Um, I am still trying to learn how to view myself as, you know, how others see me, how I spoke to that, where um, just understanding, hey, I am an adult. I've done all these things. So I think growing up, I was beyond lucky. Not everyone is lucky to, first of all, have, you know, two amazing supportive parents, but both of my parents were very well versed in the special education world. So they knew the steps to take. They knew how to support myself as well as my two brothers growing up. And if they didn't, you know, we were fortunate. Well, they knew who to go to to ask for help. So I think, you know, sometimes we need to, we have the support systems in place and sometimes we need to figure these things out on our own. So for me, you know, growing up, a lot of it was having a lot of tantrums with homework and feeling like, I couldn't do something because I couldn't figure it out in a minute. That way I'm, I'm not smart. I'm not going to figure it out. And I won't lie. That's still something that uh, I struggle with. That's still something I'm trying to figure out. So I wouldn't say that, you know, it, it's a journey. You're never going to be ultimately at the finish line. But I think trying to put yourself in positions where you're surrounded by people who support you, whether it is family or whether it's people at school or work or wherever it may be, that was really helpful. Always having a good support system of friends growing up. Um, and I think, you know, having two older brothers to look up to and see how they did things and sort of putting my own twist on it where I can be my own person, but I can sort of figure out what's worked for other people, what's going to work for me. And it's a lot of trial and error to figure out how to become independent and what works for you. So I can only speak to my experiences, but I think by doing things such as um, going to study abroad, that was a really scary thing for me, but I learned 
you know, different skills um, and different ways to communicate and to sort of survive on that kind of more realistic basis. But I think also um, learning to become independent actually involves communicating and asking for help. I think that's a big piece of it is you will become more independent when you can learn you don't actually have to do everything by yourself. You don't want people to do things for you, but understanding that that is a great strength was something that has really kind of flipped the switch for me and understanding that I'm not alone. I don't have to feel like that. And there are people and structures in place, you know, that can help me. So I think a big piece is a, a really big turning point. It's very winded answer, but this is how my brain works. So I apologize. Um, but I think really my metacognition has grown significantly because I'm working with kids who are really similar to me. So again, not everyone, you know, is in that experience. So I'm very lucky to, to kind of be living in the reality where we're kind of, our worlds are, are meshing. So that's been really interesting. And I think um, it just comes down to being honest with yourself and it can be scary, but I think being vulnerable makes you stronger and makes you more independent. So again, independent is not synonymous with doing things by yourself. And I hope that was sort of a, a take home message from today, if nothing else. Yep, I agree with you, that's great. Um, Andrea um, says, Mallory, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with ADHD and anxiety. Your courage and transparency is helping so many children, adults, parents, and families. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Teresa. Do you have advice for how to encourage a young adult to listen to these kinds of sessions? We were just talking about that before, um, before we went live. Um, she is very reluctant to seek out help for managing her ADHD. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a, a very good question. It's a hard one. I can, you know, only speak for my experiences, but um, I've been doing some work as like kind of creating some curriculum guides for parents um, to how to support their children. So something that I was writing about in those guides is that, and this goes for, for young adults as well, is that we need to take a deep breath and put our ego and pride to the side and truly understand that if you want to become resilient, if you want to become gritty, all of these people, right, that are resilient, that are super hardworking, you know, that they, they will, you will fail and that's okay. I think sometimes you just need to, you might not listen to mom or dad, but if you have an experience where you fail, how can we learn from this mistake? We don't have to do it again and again and again. If we don't change anything, if we're not truly comfortable with the life we're living and we don't change anything, then nothing's going to change. So, you know, I certainly have come a long way from where I was when I was five, from that, you know, breakdown, all those many breakdowns. Um, but, you know, these things don't go away. The anxiety, the ADHD, it doesn't disappear, but we just figure out how to, how to deal with it. So I would say that as a parent, you know, tell your child that you're there for them. You may understand it if you live this experience, you may not. But I think sometimes giving your child space to sort of make their own mistakes, to fail, but then always let them know that no matter what happens, I'm there for you. You know, you have me to talk to. If you don't want to talk to me, talk to another adult. Talk to someone else who you trust. Because I think just open lines of communication are so helpful. But learning how to become a self-advocate isn't something that we can just tell our kids, go do it. Model it for them. Tell your child when you've had to advocate for yourself at work. What was something that was really scary or that you didn't feel you were being treated right? How did you... What steps did you take to fix that problem? I think giving coming from your own experiences with your child to your child can be very helpful. Sort of just being transparent and open. You know, I wish I could tell you that there's just a magic wand I could um, wave and that you know I could get your kid to do X, Y, and Z, but I can't. And I know that's not an answer. You you know that's super helpful. But I think time is our friend. Time is is here and when your child is ready, 
they will learn how to ask for help. Help looks different for everybody. So don't expect your child to take the steps you necessarily want them to take because they're not you, even though they are your child, even if they have siblings, they're not going to need the same things as their siblings may or may not need. So just understand that and sort of meet them where they are now. But, you know, remind them that you're here for them. If they need your help, you will do whatever it takes. You're on their team. You want them to be successful. And that success is, you know, for them to make. Their story is for them to write for themselves. And it doesn't need to be written all in one day. So time and space and communication, I think, are, are super helpful kind of strategies. Not a super, you know, go do this. But I think just having an understanding of it can't be fixed in a day, but eventually, you know, your child will be where they need to be. And that's something important to hang on to and understand. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, and uh, let's see, uh, when your anxiety peaks or it's worse, how do you calm down? Um, this person says, I end up freaking out and losing focus. Yeah, um, well, uh, the last time that it happened was this morning. I was feeling very anxious and uncomfortable with this conversation, and it happens a lot. So I think that, sort of like I mentioned, I, and maybe you as well can relate to this, where I understand what's happening. I know why I'm feeling the way I am, but I try to think of what have I done successful in the past that was similar to this? I've survived every single day up until today and you know i know what to do i can take a deep breath for me going to work out going to move my body is very helpful going to sweat um talking to other people i think it has been a crazy time and feeling super isolated uh and i know my anxiety has certainly peaked a lot during the last you know year and a half two years with covid and quarantine and everything so i think you know, reaching out to a friend or to a family member or a therapist, you know, whoever it is, a therapist, I think that's super important. Um, for me, something I try have been trying to do that uh, my therapist recommended was trying to kind of create a little chart. So when I feel something is coming up that's making me feel really anxious, like I just got an email and I have the urge that I need to respond to it immediately and I can't stop thinking about it until I do. You know, if I allow myself to try to create a pause between this before taking action, because sometimes I move too quickly and that impulsivity and anxiety is not a great um, team for me. So I need to kind of press pause. And if I can write down something that I did, no matter how small it is that I didn't respond to the email within the hour it was sent, that's a win for me. I know it sounds super small and ridiculous, but I think little things like that I know I do a lot of sort of breathing with headspace just to calm myself down and just take deep breaths um, can be really helpful. And just sort of sometimes talking things out, I think a lot of the times I feel anxious about things that have nothing to do with anything and are extremely small. And for me, they're very valid. But when I sort of talk about them, like they seem sort of ridiculous to be anxious about someone you know, texted me in a different way or they didn't respond right away, something must be wrong. So I think just understanding that here's my anxiety. I know it's going to come. Just be kind of having that self-talk with yourself. I know it's going to come. I know what to do. I can move my body. I can go talk to someone. I can write things down. I can step away. I think trying to push through and grind through it isn't always the option. Stepping back and coming back to whatever your problem is later can be helpful. But I think kind of giving our space time, ourselves time to ruminate is not good. And that's what I do a lot. And I'm trying to kind of create more of a plan around that. So I know my anxiety is coming. Here are some things in my toolkit that seem to work for me. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we have a couple of people who are asking whether or not um, you, uh, uh, in addition to the other things that you talked about, um, and then you can decline whether or not you want to um, say whether or not you're taking medication to help with your ADHD and your anxiety. Definitely. Um, 
So I have been on medication probably since I was like eight years old. Um, and, you know, this is something, sure, I don't want to be on medication for the rest of my life. But also, if I know that, you know, my mood can be better or that I can be a better version of me, I'm all for taking medication. I know not everybody feels that way. So you need to figure out what's right for you and what's right for your child. Um, but I'm definitely a big believer in that medication can be extremely valuable and helping you sort of find your way. I don't think that it's the only resource or the only solution. So if you don't feel comfortable with that, don't think that there's no other way to to deal with this. But that's certainly something that I'm in the camp of. You know, I think medication can be uh, a lifesaver for a lot of people. So that's certainly something you know, to consider. And if you're not sure what to do, how to do, there's so many things, you know, so many different medications, right? Speak with, you know, people at your child's school, a counselor, psychiatrist, psychologist, you know, whoever it may be. Um, and you don't have to do this alone. This is someone's job to help you figure this out. So if that's something you want, there are certainly people you can add to your child's team and really improve their quality of life. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and then one more question in regards to the medication. As a teenager, did you have difficulty taking medication or medications or did you not want to? Um, if so, how did you get through it? Definitely. Um, that's a good question. So, uh, well, thanks to my genetics, my lovely genetics, um, my, you know, we we're all, many people in my family were on medication. So this wasn't something that was sort of very rare and weird, like this crazy thing. So for me, this is sort of the life that I understood and was aware of. And it's just like, this is what you we're going to try. And, you know, if you don't like it, we don't have to take it. But, you know, obviously, if it makes you feel better, then why not? Um, so, but, uh, you know, being in the classroom for several years and working directly with kids one-on-one -on -one now, I know that, you know, this isn't always the case. A lot of kids don't want to do this. Because, you know, maybe they fear that it will change who they are, you know, as, as a person. But I think it's also important to consider, yes, it may change who you are and the fact that it may make you feel better. It may make you feel more positive about yourself and realize I can be more productive or I can focus on something or I can calm my emotions down a little bit. So I think that, you know, ultimately it's a conversation you need to have with your child. I think that it depending on their age, but remember that you are the parent and the child, your child is the child. So this is, this is a challenging experience to sort of figure out, but you know, it doesn't have to be a forever thing. It doesn't have to be a forever solution, but I think that, you know, if you can have your child speak to other, you know, maybe a support group or other kids who are in dealing with similar uh, issues with ADHD or anxiety and taking medication, that can be really helpful just to realize I'm not the only kid doing this. You know, a lot more kids actually are taking medication than I might realize. And this makes me feel a little bit better about myself realizing that I'm not weird. I just, I need something to, to be better. Just like if you need glasses to see, you give your child glasses. So if you need medication or if you need a certain support, you know, it's sort of the same kind of parallel analogy in that so kind of understand and explain to your child why just be transparent with them depending you know on their age and age appropriate way i think can be really helpful great thank you um I'm gonna, i have one more question um before we wrap up for today um do you have any advice for people who feel like they are alone and they don't have a support system are there any other avenues um, that you would suggest that they reach out to to kind of get a little bit more support so maybe their family isn't very supportive or knowledgeable or not willing to to help them what do you have any advice on that yeah that's a great question I mean I will say even just uh, if you're looking for something simple I think that social media can be really good and really bad um, but for us at Essig Education Group we have uh, a parent support group and 
if you're someone who's maybe alone and more of a teen or young adult, you can absolutely join our group where this is a sort of a safe place just to talk and to share experiences. And I think just since we sort of started it in, um, in May, it's been a really great place for parents to realize that, again, you're not alone or even young adults or teens, you're not alone. Here are some tips we can talk about. We have monthly discussions, um, webinars. And I think that's a really great way is just to, even if you don't feel comfortable sharing, just to listen to other people and read information and hear different people's stories. I think that's a really great strategy. You know, I think that even in the kind of day and age with COVID now, I know that there are a lot of online resources um, for speaking with therapists online, which can be another great resource. I know that maybe that's something that sort of has a stigma around it, but you know, you can certainly find a therapist who takes insurance or try to figure something out as more of a cost-effective option. But I think whether it's, even if it's just a friend to begin with, or going to find some type of support group, I know a lot of support groups are free and you can even do it online on Zoom these days, if that's something you're more comfortable with. I think taking that step, being vulnerable and just reaching out, finding help, whether it's from other adults, whether it's people at school, whether it's people, if you're at, in, at a job or in college, whatever it may be, um, you know, you're not alone. Even if you don't have maybe that nuclear family support, I want you to know that, you know, we have a whole, so many people in the world who are going through what you're going through. And I don't want you to feel like you have to do it alone. So first, absolutely join uh, our Facebook group, find other groups, find things, resources online, you know, feel free to email me and I will help you find something that seems to be a good fit for you. Um, Cause I think it's so important to, to talk, just to talk it out. And you can even just by expressing how you feel that can kind of feel like a huge weight is taken off of your back by just breathing and explaining your situation. Cause someone, someone needs to hear it. Thank you. That was wonderful advice. Um, and just so you guys know, um, I did, paste um, Mallory's email address into the chat so you have that. Um, I did have one more question that came in and then we'll, then we'll wrap up. Um, the question was, did you get addicted to anything during your teenage years or during your young adult years? Um, no, I was never, um, you know, addicted to anything. I think like any other, you know, college student, I had fun and things like that, but I uh, was totally, you know, in control. And I think that really comes from, it's, I think, kind of a big take-home message is being self-aware and having people around you understand what's going on in your brain and in your mind so that if you do, that's okay. You know, life is not easy for anybody. But if you have ADHD or anxiety, it's going to be harder. And I won't, you know, sugarcoat it. But I think the fact that if you know, having people around you to help call you out if there's something you're addicted to or, you know, going down an avenue that maybe you shouldn't. Just having the support system, having somebody or something to help you feel in control of your own life. So, like I've mentioned before, I think exercise can be a huge, you know, maybe we don't want it to become necessarily a huge addiction, but it can be something that can be really helpful that's maybe more positive um, than turning to substances or things that are more destructive. Um, but I know that, you know, it is with the way our brains are wired, it is a lot easier to become addicted to things when we have ADHD. So I think understanding what your brain is like and just coming to terms with this is who I am. I sort of have life that's going to be a little bit harder for me but I'm not going to take the victim mentality. What can I do to help myself? Who can help me? And then finding those supports. So if you're finding yourself in a dark place, you know, we've all been somewhere dark at one point or another. It might not look the same, but the first step is just asking for help. Someone is there when you're ready. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you for answering all those questions. Is, um, are there any or is there anything else that you wanted to cover before we wrap up for today? No, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. Please, you know, feel free if you have any questions or didn't feel comfortable asking, 
you know, feel free to email me. I'd love to talk more. Um, so just thank you for listening. I know life is crazy. So thank you for taking this hour out of your day. I really do appreciate it and really appreciate this opportunity. So thank you. And we very much appreciate you and, and you sharing your story with us. Thank you. All right. Have a good day, everybody.